So this summer, in August, I get to go to a wedding. My niece, my goddaughter, is getting married. And I'm looking forward to it, just to see her and her husband and the love that God has given them. And, and starting their life together. Of course, seeing family, too. Getting together afterwards. Eating. Dancing. Well, that part is not my favorite. I have nothing against dancing. I just know Kevin Bacon. Um, but in the dance, there's always, there's always, there always seems to be a couple of dances that just kind of suck you in. Um, for that reason, I've thought of them, I've thought of three of what I would call the worst, or the best, depending on how you look at it, the worst wedding dances of all time. The chicken dance. <laughs> I'm not going to perform that for you, but minister dance anyway, if you ask me. I don't like that. <laughs> hokey pokey. And the combo line. I always ask myself, who, who, what kind of person starts a combo line? <coughs> I mean, what kind of person has the guts to ask the band or whoever to play this, to put this song on the tape, and to just have that audacity to get up knowing that everybody's going to follow you around the room? And yet they do. For some reason, that person can get one or two other people to follow along. And, and as, the, as the line grows, so does the rate of growth of the line. And eventually, almost everybody there will see somebody, a wife, a husband, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a, you know, a friend, and say, well, they're doing it. I guess I can do it, too. And the line grows. And you, you learn something from that. Of course, there's that one guy or lady who is the leader. right? They have that position of leadership, like winding this thing through the room. But really, everybody in that line is a leader because they've influenced somebody else to jump in, somebody else to follow them. There's a point to this, I promise. Um, we talk about leadership and, and following. You know, sometimes we, we think of those as mutually exclusive, but they're really not. You know, everybody in life is a leader of some kind, whether it's a, a, an assigned position of authority or not. We all influence other people by our thoughts, by our actions, by what we say and do to follow, whether they do or not. We all lead. The question is, are you a good leader? Are you bringing people into a line that they need to be in? And if you're a good leader, it's because you know who to follow. So that, that's one perfect or aspect of, of a good leader, one of the most important aspects of a good leader is that they know themselves who to follow, who's going to get them where they need to go and how. That's the lesson that we learned from Joshua chapter 5, a lesson in leadership, how he was a leader, and he was a good leader because he knew how to follow his God. I want to read this to you again from Joshua 5. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us? Or for our enemy? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. <coughs> then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horn in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times, with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. This is God. Now Joshua. Joshua was a man I think we could um, sympathize with. He, he became leader after Moses. And just that simple fact would be very daunting. Moses was, was un undoubtedly one of the greatest leaders in all history. That's my opinion, and I, I'll stand by that, both religiously and politically. Think about Moses, how he had taken a group of over two million unorganized, undisciplined people, 
led them out of Egypt <coughs> through the wilderness for 40 years, feeding them and giving them water, establishing a nation with laws, establishing a religion with both laws and promises, giving people a future. He gave them everything that they needed, and he established a government, a well-organized government of tribes and elders and leaders and judges. Moses was, again, one of the greatest leaders of all time. And now, after Moses dies, Joshua is tapped to take over. You talk about big shoes to fill, as now everybody looks to Joshua. Can he do it? Can he take Moses' place? And one of Joshua's first tasks was to bring this group of people, well over two million people, into the nation of Israel and start attacking and sacking all of these cities. And the first city was arguably one of the hardest. Jericho sat in a, in a strategic position and was one of the most fortified cities in this entire land. And Joshua, here's your first job. Go and take Jericho. Put yourself in Joshua's shoes. What do you do? How do you do it? Our text begins with Joshua standing near Jericho, and I picture him scratching his head going, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. When all of a sudden there appears before him a man, a soldier dressed for battle, with a sword in his hand, and so Joshua, probably with a little bit of suspicion, maybe his hand on his own sword, asks him, are you for us, or are you for our enemies? And then he answers, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I come. And as this conversation goes on, Joshua and we realize who this really is. This is the Lord himself. More specifically, when you read the Old Testament and you see reference to the angel of the Lord, the commander of the armies of the Lord, generally we understand that to be one very specific person of God, the Son, who would later take on human flesh and be known as Jesus. And so here Jesus, long before he takes that name, takes that flesh, stands before Joshua and says, I don't fight for you, I fight for God. The question is, are you going to fight for me? And then he gives them his marching orders, which strategically, and I'm no military mind, but they, they don't make any sense. Just march around the city once for six days, and then march around the city seven times, and after that, the walls will fall down, and the city is yours. So really, you already won. Just do what I tell you. The question was, was Joshua going to follow? Joshua had to lead. He knew that. But was he going to follow? No, spoiler alert. He does. And Joshua fall, or Jericho falls, and the city is theirs. But there is the lesson in leadership. The lesson in leadership that Joshua learns. He needed to lead these people, but God was telling him, it's not really you leading. I'm doing it. All you need to do is follow me. And then the people will follow you, and you will succeed in everything you do. You probably started to pick this up already with Moses. Now, I praise Moses quite a bit. And maybe you started to say, well, Moses didn't do those things, and good for you. Because Moses really wasn't the one who led the people out of Egypt. Moses really wasn't the one who fed them every day or got them water from the rock. Moses wasn't the one who established all of these laws. He certainly wasn't the one who established this religion. That was all God. But he told Moses, Moses followed and the people followed him. That's why Moses was such a great leader. And it's why Joshua was such a great leader. Because they had both the humility and the wisdom to follow. To follow their God. And the people, at least for the most part, were wise enough to follow them. That's leadership. Now, there's something else I want to point you to, too. It's right before this text begins. And it shows us some of the ways that God had already been leading them. In Joshua chapter 5, beginning at verse 10, it says, On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, the very day they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain, the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. 
you know, this, this simple explanation, this simple paragraph teaches us that you know, God, God had been leading them, God had been providing them, and he brought them past this one step where God brought bread from heaven and quail in the evening until he gave them a land that would produce for them. God had been leading them all this time. They had been just simply receiving the benefits of it. But there was something else there too. Every year, and on this day, they celebrated something special. They celebrated the Passover, which really was another festival of leadership. The Passover, as we've talked about before, really looked in two directions. It looked back at how God delivered them out of Egypt. Now, he passed over the houses of the Israelites, afflicting the houses of the Egyptians, and bringing them out. But it also pointed to the future, where the blood of another lamb would be sacrificed, where the blood of another lamb would purchase eternal life for his people. And it promised them God's guidance, not just through this life, but into the next. It was that promise of this commander of the armies of the Lord coming in the flesh to sacrifice himself so that we would have heaven. God's guidance and his end goal was made clear every step of the way if they were willing to follow, if they were willing to listen. Now that's the leadership. That's Joshua's leadership. But we, we, we stress this and we talk about this and we cherish this because all of us are leaders. And maybe you have a position of leadership, an assigned position where people just naturally look to you because of your job, because of your title. Maybe you don't. But you are a leader. Because everything you do, everything you say, everything you are is influencing somebody else. Maybe it's a wife or a husband or a child or a friend. And you are leading. Whether they follow or not, you are leading. Be a good leader. How do you do it? You know, for Joshua, it was simple. Jesus came to him and said, do this. He did it, and he led well. But he does the same for us. God speaks to us. More often than not, in every decision that we make, God has spoken. This is what you are to do. And he's given us those commands that he gave to Moses that still apply. Ten of them. I'll summarize them very quickly for you. The first three, honor the Lord your God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Have no other gods. Uh, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, and remember the Sabbath day. Love God above all things. Respect God. Show Him respect in everything that you do, and listen to Him. You know, as we, as we structure our lives, as we budget our time, now this is the most important thing. That time and that, that predominance of our relationship with God, that, that takes first priority. As our relationships with one another, they continue to go <coughs> honor your father and mother. And that applies to anyone in authority, and that, that, that's sometimes a tricky one, a tough one. Those that are in authority over us who we don't agree with, God says, you still love them, <coughs> you still respect them, because you respect me. We honor those in authority because we recognize they are representatives of God, and, and our first commandment is to love him, and so we do that, and we honor him. Do not kill, do not murder. God does give times when the government will have the right to do this on behalf of its people, to protect its people. But it's not my prerogative. It's not my right to, to take a life, to, uh, to hurt, and to put myself over another. So do that. Love each other. Help each other. That's God's command, and so we honor him. Do not commit adultery. Take the, the blessing of marriage and hold it sacred. Blessing of one man and one woman and the sexual intimacy therein within the confines of marriage, which lasts a lifetime. Respect that and honor that and embrace that and honor God. Do not steal. Don't take what's yours. Don't want to take what's yours. Don't bear false testimony. Don't lie. But don't even use your words if they're true to hurt somebody else. Using your words to hurt. In 9 and 10, do not covet. Don't complain about what you don't have to God. Because God is the giver of all good things. Be content with what you do. <coughs> Almost every decision that we make can, can be dictated by those commands. Is this going to give honor to God? Is this going to help my fellow man honor God? Because if it isn't, 
then that's not the leadership. Then that's not the path I want to take. But if it is, but what do we learn about God? When we follow God's, God's will, when we follow God's law, He never hurts us. He only promises the best for us. Even if it might hurt for a while, it's always in our good. And ultimately to lead us to that heavenly goal. Because of the law that He kept. Because Jesus died. Jesus took the blame for all those commandments we've broken. And that following of God not only makes us good leaders, but it lets us know that we have a place with Him in eternity. That's the path He's given to us, and it's a clear path. Follow it. You know, we're all leaders, and sometimes that can be a daunting task. But since you are leaders, lead well. Follow your God, and you will be blessed. And you will be a blessing to those who have the wisdom to follow you, both now and in eternity. Amen. And now may this peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Once again, please rise and turn to page 20 and we join in singing together, Create in Me. Father in heaven, as you have so richly blessed the work of our hands, we now ask you to receive the fruit of our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we remember two of our brothers. We remember, first of all, Bob uh, Tramick, the um, brother of Jesus who passed away this week, was called his eternal rest. We also remember our brother here at Grace, Gordon Gates, who was called home on Friday night both to the eternal glory. We praise God for this, and we ask that God give comfort to, his, to their families. So please rise and turn to page 20. We join in the prayer of the church. Father in heaven, we thank you for all of the gifts that you give us in life and how you use us to bless this world. We ask that you give us the wisdom to use all of our gifts for your glory to help the people of this world. As you guide us through this world, we sometimes have great joy, we sometimes have great trial, but in all of it, you hold before our eyes your blessings now and in eternity. You hold before our eyes that, that joy of heaven. And now we thank you for giving that in its fullness to both Bob and to Gordon. We thank you for bringing them to faith. We thank you for strengthening that faith through your word and now allowing them to see you face to face. We ask that you allow their families to see this more clearly so that that 
pain which is theirs, may turn to joy. We ask that you keep all of us focused on this truth as we carry out our lives, service to you in this world, as we enjoy the blessings that you give. Help us to always keep in mind that goal, the goal that you have prepared for us and guaranteed us a life with you in eternity. We ask all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. As we continue with our next hymn, 452, let us ever walk with Jesus. <laughs> 